In Jesus' name we pray. Our Father, we thank you very much for the way you are dealing with your children. We bless your name because of your goodness. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for everything that you have prepared and provided for us. We thank you, Lord, because we know very definitely this year is going to be different for us. You have equipped us already, and we know that your blessings will flow through our lives. We join with the members of the campus choir, and we believe and we say that everything we do will prosper. We are planted by the rivers of waters, and we know that our leaves will not wither. We will bear fruit. We are asking, O oh Lord, that you will be glorified in our lives and ministries in Jesus' name. As we come to the concluding chapter of the epistle to the Philippians, Lord, we pray that all that you provided for us, you still help us to receive. Like Jesus said, that if we confess and believe that we receive, we shall have. Make us fruitful. Make our ministries fulfilled. Be glorified through us, O Lord. In Jesus' name, we pray. We come now to the concluding chapter of the epistle to the Philippians. And uh, we've titled the message, The Secrets of a Fruitful Life. As you look at chapter 4, there are some verses that stand out very clearly. And uh, these verses we have read perhaps more often than other verses in the epistle. In Philippians chapter 4 verse 4, Rejoice in the Lord always. And again I say rejoice. That's a commandment and it is possible that you rejoice every time. We're going to rejoice in Jesus' name. In verse 13, I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. I can do, you will do it. All things through Christ strengthening us. Verse 19, but my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. You'll see that the epistle is closing up now with a great revelation which is given through inspired exhortation and influential example of Paul the Apostle. There are great secrets here for every believer and every minister to learn in the chapter. Secrets which will give us grace and give us power to live a full life and a fulfilled life as well as granting us a full and fulfilled ministry. In fact, as you look at the chapter, you will discover that all that God expects of our lives and ministries and all that we desire for our own lives and ministries are provided here in the form of both precepts and promise. Just to have a rundown before we really study you're going to see in this chapter number one steadfastness number two unity in life and in doctrine and in labor number three you'll see uninterrupted joy number four continual peace number five spirit controlled thoughts and god ordained actions number six you'll find confidence in god seven competence to handle all of life's situations. Number eight, you are going to find victory over anxiety and contentment in Christ. Nine, there is provision for all our needs in all circumstances. Ten, there is the power to do all that God demands of us to do. And then number eleven, you are going to find gifts from God and gifts from men coming into your life. Number 12, grace and goodness from God, the God of glory. Indeed, to summarize everything, you're going to have the supply of all your needs according to God's riches in glory. All this 
and much more are revealed to be ours as we pray, making supplication with thanksgiving. Others have seen the fulfillment of these realities in their lives, and our own time has now come, so that we also will see and experience the fulfillment of these things in our lives and ministries. Paul, in particular, spoke of the confidence of living such a victorious life, such a fruitful life, such a fulfilled life. If you look at this chapter, you are going to find out that he used the pronoun I quite a number of times. And he used them in such a fulfilling manner. And he rejoiced because he said, I rejoiced in the Lord greatly. And if you can say that, and I want to remind you of his situation, he was in the prison. And yet as he looked at everything, looked at all the circumstances, he said, I have no regrets. He said, there is nothing to murmur about. He said, there's no complaint at all. I look at everything the Lord has done with my life since I came into the kingdom. And there's only one thing I can say. I rejoice greatly. And then he said, I have learned in whatever state I am, there we to be contained. You can see the secret of the man. Another time in the chapter he says, I know both how to be abased and how to abound. It says it doesn't matter where you put me in the dungeon or you put me in the palace. You are going to learn something that I know. In whatever situation I am, both to be abased and to abound. Then he said, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And then he says, I have all and I abound and I am full. You can't go beyond that. I have everything I need to have. I am bound. I'm surrounded. I'm surrounded by every form of blessing. In fact, now I am full. He was free from worry, free from anxiety. Even though he was writing the epistle from the prison, he was full of joy and full of peace. His heart and mind were kept by the peace of God that passes all understanding. And such a life will be yours. As we remain in Christ, abide in Christ, such a contented life, satisfied life, fulfilled life can be ours and it will be ours in Jesus' name. Now we look at uh, three points in the message today. Number one, steadfastness and cooperation. Steadfastness and cooperation. Number two, the strength of Christian character. What makes the character of a Christian, the conduct of a Christian, the new life of a Christian, actually what makes it very strong? The strength of, a, of Christian character. And then number three, the source of consecration and contentment. The source of consecration and contentment. Let's start from verse 1 of Philippians chapter 4. It says, therefore, that's a connecting word. Is saying, I've told you already in chapter 3, that we're looking up for the coming of Christ. Our conversation is in heaven. Our citizenship is in heaven. We're looking up now, and anytime the Savior, our Lord Jesus Christ, will come. And when he comes, you know what he's going to do? He's going to change our vile body. In fact, we're going to be fashioned like unto his glorious body. And he will submit, subject, subdue all things unto himself. He says, therefore, because of the exaltation. Here is the exaltation. Because of the exaltation of Christ. And because of our glorification in Christ. And because of the consummation of all the promises of God. Because of the climax of the joy we're going to have. Because we're expecting Christ coming from above. And it will change our vile body. And will be like unto him. Therefore, you see the very reason for the life of the believer. Because of our expectation. Because of the exaltation. Because of the great things God will do for your life and in my life. And because of the crown, because of the reward. It says, therefore, my brethren. He was now going to talk to the believers. And he calls them by different names. Number one, they are brethren. Members of the same family. 
dearly beloved because they are loved and they are dear unto the Lord. Longed for because they are the people that have intimate fellowship with the Lord and he wanted to see them. There was a bond of fellowship in between them. Then he says, you are my joy. He says, it's not money that is my joy. It's not material things that will be my joy. The converts, the brethren, the people that his ministry are brought into the kingdom, he said, you are my joy. In fact, he said, you are my crown. He said, there is no other thing I'm looking for. He said, in fact, the crown I'm going to receive in heaven will just be a symbol, a representation of uh, my converts. And all the stars I will have in that crown will be representing my converts. Therefore, really, it's not the crown I'm going to wear. You are the people that will be my reward. You are my joy and you are my crown. Now, you had a message for them. Because of what we're expecting, here is what you are to do, so stand fast in the Lord, my dearly beloved. And that is the exhortation the Lord is also giving us. He's telling us that we must stand fast in the faith and stand fast in the Lord so that we'll be able to show that we really have this intimate relationship and fellowship with the Lord. In First Thessalonians chapter 3, First Thessalonians chapter 3, and in verse 8, it says, for now we live, if ye stand fast in the Lord. Uh, have you noticed the uh, use of the pronouns there? We live, we live the joyful life. We live, we live the fulfilled life. We live, we who are preachers, we live the fulfilled and fruitful life. If you, our converts, if you, the people that are hearing the word of God, if you stand fast in the Lord. And so you'll find that the joy of the preacher is to find that your converts are standing faithful in the Lord. Second Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 15. Therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold the traditions which ye have been taught, whether by word or by our epistle. It said, This is our joy. And this is the reason we are saying that you are our crown. And the reward we're going to have, if you will hold fast, hold firm, all the things you have learned from us, whether we taught you by word directly face to face, or we wrote to you and we taught you by the epistles we have written to you. In Revelation chapter 3 and verse 11, we are to stand fast. Revelation chapter 3 and verse 11, it says, Behold, I come quickly. Hold that fast which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. All that you have learnt, all that you have known, you will hold it fast, so that none will take your crown. He was talking to them and was calling them to steadfastness and calling them to unity. He was telling them the fellowship should continue. The fellowship between them as believers and fellowship between them and Paul the Apostle, their leader. He said that will make him to know that he will rejoice on the final day. In spite of oppositions, in spite of persecution, we are to stand fast so that we will not be moved. It means that we must maintain a spiritual conviction we must maintain a spiritual position in spite of enemies and in spite of false teachers. We are to always remain faithful to the word of God and stand immovable. Now I was going to talk to some workers in that church in Philippians chapter 4 and in verse 2. It said, I beseech your dears and I beseech Syntyche that they be of the same mind in the Lord. And those were two women in the church at Philippi. I'm sure you know that uh, the Philippian church started as uh, Paul the Apostle and Silas, as uh, they got into Macedonia, come over to Macedonia and help us. And when they got to uh, Philippi, they saw that a group of women had been meeting for prayers. And that was where they started the ministry. And now the church has been planted, the church has been raised, and the disciples were being developed. There were these two women there. Obviously, they must have been in the working team. But there was some disagreement in between them. And Paul the Apostle heard 
And Paul the Apostle said, don't let disunity mar the beauty of the Philippian church. Because everything in the Philippian church was actually praiseworthy. And so he said, I'm pleading with those two women. I'm begging those two women that they be of the same mind in the Lord. And the same thing the Lord is telling us is telling us that we should be of the same mind in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and in verse 10. Now I beseech you, brethren, by the, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye all speak the same thing. That's the strength of the church. When whichever branch you go to, that's the strength of the church. Whichever location you go to, we speak the same thing. We're preaching the same doctrine. We're having the same emphasis. There is support. There is cooperation. There is unity. There is harmony in between us. It says all the brethren, it says we should all speak the same thing. And that there be no divisions among you. But that ye be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. And that's what the apostle was telling those two women. And it's not only for those two women. It's telling every one of us that we should have that same unity. And you know, there'll be, sometimes there'll be some little, little differences. But if there are not differences in doctrine, if there are not differences in the convictions of the teaching of the Bible, if there are not differences on the things that really count and the things that really matter, we shouldn't allow those little differences, maybe differences in personality, differences in the way you talk, in the way I talk, differences in, uh, you know, whether you're extrovert or introvert, some differences that are just temperamental. We shouldn't allow that to come into the church and disturb and distract the church. We should make sure that whatever those differences are, not on doctrine, not on Bible standard, not on the things the Bible is teaching, you should understand that. It says we should remain united. I pray that we we'll remain united in Jesus' name. And you see, whenever differences exist, instead of you breeding that disagreement, brooding over it, and expanding it, we should be peacemakers, rather than becoming judges and taking sides and saying, I agree with so-and-so, that's going to tear the church apart. Whenever you see that there are some differences, and you know that we believe the same Christ, we stand on the same doctrine, we're teaching the same thing, and everything that is actually very important, everything is the same, but there are differences on this one and that one, which are not really of much consequence in the church life. You will not take sides. All you will do as a minister of God is that you will be a peacemaker so that you will help those people who are sincerely laboring in the gospel and tell them to forget all those differences that do not count so we can concentrate on the things that really count. And then in verse 3, And I indeed, I entreat thee also, true yoke fellow, help those women which labor with me in the gospel, with Clement also, and with other my fellow laborers whose names are in the book of life. Here Paul the Apostle was writing to this in uh, the Philippian church. He said, you know, one man cannot get everything done. In fact, all the men cannot do everything. There are women that will also be involved. And they help in the work, they labor in the work of the gospel. And he was telling the rest of the people, as we help you to be your best in your own ministry, you also help all the others that are involved in the ministry. And he said, I'm pleading with you. If I were there, you will see my emotion, you will be able to feel my emotion. If I were there with you, not separated because of the walls of the prison that keep me here, you will see it on my face as I'll be pleading with you. But even though you cannot see me, I'm entreating you. True yoke fellow, we are bearing the same yoke. We're doing the same thing. If I were there, this is what I will do. I will help those women that are laboring with me in the gospel. Although I'm not there, we are true you fellows together. Even the same way, you will help those women that are laboring with me in the gospel. With Clement also. 
he mentioned another person now a man and he said you will help him he said i cannot mention everybody with other my fellow laborers he said many hands on the plow and we're laboring together and um, in fact these people they have their names written in the book of life and it says please be of help to them would you then take a decision as you are going back to your location that you will be of help there will be no discrimination you will not say that is uh, you know the youth section be of help you will not say that is campus section i'm not a university graduate therefore let them see to what they're doing be of help you'll not say that's a women's section i don't know what those women are doing women we can evangelize and can do everything i don't know why they raise up this uh, women ministry be of help and the children's section will be there uh, be of help and uh, the usher security musicians uh, members of the choir whatever the section may be be of help let us know that we are laboring together and it says we are true yoke fellows and we are under the same yoke and we are doing the same work together our names are written in the book of life in all in all cases and whatever you have to do let there be unity let there be cooperation i believe it will be so in jesus name we will help one another rather than hindering one another uh, you know you can bring the whole thing down scatter the whole thing destroy the whole thing if i take care of my section and then i destroy the other section if you try to take care of your section and you destroy my own section and we fight the other section while we're trying to lift up my own area which is the most important and you are trying to lift up your own area which to you is the most important and the areas of work that other people are doing they are not important no don't act like that you will in honor prefer one another you see my section is important you do everything you can do to help me i see that your section is very important and i do everything i can do to help you and we do that to one another our churches will grow in jesus name in first peter chapter 3 in first peter chapter 3 and verses 8 and 9 finally be ye all of one mind having compassion one of another love as brethren be pitiful be courteous not rendering evil for evil that section they didn't respect our section the other time when we had the program we will do it for them and this time now don't do that don't retaliate there should be no revenge if they were if they were neglectful or they were a negligent rather and they were forgetful and they didn't do what they should do towards you don't pay them back in that kind of bad coin not rendering evil for evil or railing for railing but contrary wise blessing knowing that ye are there unto called that ye should inherit a blessing it's as we help one another each section helping the other section that by the grace of god we're going to inherit a blessing and you know that this year is a year of blessing and we have got the blessing already and will inherit the blessing of the lord every day of the year in jesus name now we go to point number two that is the strength of christian character the strength of christian character these verses are very significant when you consider the character of a christian they are from verse 4 to verse 9 it says rejoice in the lord always and again i say rejoice let your moderation be known unto all men the lord is at hand be careful for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving let your request be made known unto god and the god of peace and the peace of god which passes all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through christ jesus finally brethren whatsoever things are true whatsoever things are honest whatsoever things are just whatsoever things are pure whatsoever things are lovely whatsoever things of good report whatsoever things are, uh, be of virtue if there be any virtue and if there be any praise think on these things and those things which uh, ye have both learnt and received and heard and seen in me do and uh, the god of peace uh, shall be with you that's the strength of 
Christian character. But I'm going to mention something before I move on. Uh, you know, as I've told you now, sometimes we have some little, little differences. And sometimes in our churches, some of these little, little differences can cause some unnecessary problems. You know, sometimes the preacher is preaching. And then when he is, uh, as he's preaching, he says point one, point two, like I do. And then he says finally, point three. And then he goes on. And after going on, then he says, uh, please excuse me. Now finally, point four. And then you tune him off. You say, well, he doesn't know what he's saying. Let's come back now to chapter 3, verse 1. Chapter 3, verse 1. What's the first word there? Finally, my brethren. And so you thought he was going to conclude. And then he goes on and on and on. And then he comes to chapter 4 and he says, by the way, now verse 8, finally. And so don't say, uh, you know, those differences are there. And you will be judging in your mind. He's not done it well. He's not done it well. Let's be patient with one another. Help one another. Just appreciate one another. And don't mind some of those little, little things. Now, we come to this strength of Christian character. True Christians are known to God. And they have their names written in the book of life. That's why Paul the Apostle said, You have those brethren whose names are in the book of life. And then he's saying that he gives us a series of exhortations, which if we observe, will strengthen the character of the Christian and bring spiritual growth and maturity. The one thing he says in verse 4, Rejoice in the Lord. Not outside the Lord, in the Lord. Make sure that in your joy, don't forget yourself. You remain in the Lord while you are rejoicing. If you ever get out of the Lord and you backslide, then there is no cause for joy. If your joy is going to continue, you must remain in the Lord. Rejoice in the Lord always. On the other hand now, if you are in the Lord, you then shall continue rejoicing at all times. Times of problems, rejoice in the Lord. Times of persecution, rejoice in the Lord. When your tasks are great and you feel that it's beyond your power and you are wondering, how is it the Lord has called me to do this great, difficult task? Rejoice in the Lord. And when it seems that you don't understand all the things that are happening around you, you look at your local church and you don't understand Maybe there is a purging going on there, you don't understand. Maybe the Lord is stirring up the people there, you don't understand. Maybe the Lord is bringing some revelations in that place. I don't mean a vision. I mean some things you didn't know before. And now the Lord is revealing those things and then they are disturbing you. How is this happening? The Lord does not want to keep you in ignorance. Once you know that you are still in the Lord, whatever is happening in that local church, rejoice. And therefore in the day and in the night whatever happens let the joy of the lord always be your strength and then he tells us in verse 5 let your moderation be known unto all men the lord is at hand he's saying that in everything that you do avoid extremes avoid extravagance at the time of wedding let your moderation be known to all men and you have wedded and now you've got a child and you want to get some few people together to pray with you on that ch for that child and name that child make sure that your moderation is known unto all men the lord has provided some finance for you and you want to dress you should dress neatly but make sure that you are moderate let your moderation be known unto all men uh, you are considering you want to buy a vehicle and uh, you know that this vehicle will serve you as well as the other vehicle why are you going to go for something extravagant? Why are you going to go for something that other people will be wondering? What kind of vehicle is this person riding? Let your moderation be known unto all men. And then maybe you have lost one of your relatives and you are going to have a funeral ceremony. You have to bury your dead. But then at that time, let your moderation be known unto all men. And your children now, they are getting older. And uh, you send them to university and they are going to have graduation. And while they are having the graduation, they invite you, their daddy or their mommy, make sure that in that graduation ceremony, let your moderation be known unto all men. And you know, as we come over here now, and uh, you know, we, we're just in a fellowship together, don't come and, uh, you know, advertise, exhibit how much the Lord has provided for you. 
because you might make another person to stumble as we're here together let your moderation be known unto all men in fact when you are giving testimony about yourself and you are trying to say this this and this even at that time let your moderation be known unto all men you know why because the lord is at hand you don't want him to come and find you in extreme in extravagance you don't want him to come and find you in worldliness. You don't want him to come and find that all the, all the wedge of gold that Achan took, he deposited it in your place. You don't want him to come and find out the Babylonish garment that Achan stole in Jericho, that he deposited it in your wardrobe. You want to make sure that in all situations and at all times, your moderation is known. Not only that you say, I know I'm moderate. I know I'm not extravagant. I must see that you are moderate. Others must see that you are moderate. Because that moderation will be known unto the people that see you and the people that are watching you. Let it be known, in fact, not only to the believers. Let the unbelievers also. Let them know that you are moderate. Let your moderation be known unto all men because the Lord is at hand. The imminence of the lord's return shall restrain our passions and our actions so that we do not do anything that will show that uh, we are forgetting ourselves and we are forgetting that the bible teaches separation from the world the bible teaches moderation and uh, you women i believe that you still remember the bible teaches it's not with gold uh, with broided hair with pearls with jewelry and uh, not only in your ears it's, it should be it shouldn't be in your nose and all these attachment now that uh, women put on their on their head i think uh, we need to know that our moderation should still be there deep alive we're not uh, 25 years yet what if we become 50 years what are we going to see and uh, in, our, in our lagos church here uh, we generally in our search the scripture we make our children that is the youth we make them to teach young people of their age so when we have study scripture the adult teacher will be teaching the adult and then the student will be teaching the students and uh, one of the sundays very recently a girl was to teach the others that girl is born again and i interviewed her i normally interview them before they teach and uh, i said when were you born again she told me i said are your parents born again she said yes uh, both your father and your mother she said yes i said which church do they go they come to deeper life and i asked those children quite a lot of questions i said uh, did your uh, did your parents uh, come to deeper life before you were even born she said yes i said were they born again before you were born she said yes and they've been in deeper life before you were born she said yes then i stopped but i observed that the girl had holes in the ear and i wondered that those parents had been in deeper life before that child was born and they knew that women will not use jewelry why do you put a stumbling block in the in the front of your daughter when you know the child is not going to use the thing why do you make provision for it therefore let your moderation be known unto all men when you have those daughters praise the lord you yourself before the daughter was born you are not using jewelry why are you going to put holes in the ears of a of a such a person and uh, you know if you look at some of us here uh, some women that are you know very very you know of age i know one of our women coordinators here in lagos and she wouldn't mind uh, the you know she was born more than 40 years ago now but the parents they were not in deeper life the parents were in a particular church where they don't choose jewelry not even a church that you will know is not a common church but every time you see that sister now she's married now she has many children now she's a coordinator she's beyond the 40 years of age she might even be going to 50 years of age who knows but you don't find holes in the ear her parents when she was born decided that they are not going to put anything there because they are not using the thing and she was not born again she was in that church she was not born again really and eventually she came in the 80s to our church here and became born again but she had no problem after she was born again because the parents did not even make provision for worldliness i'm appealing to you don't make provision for worldliness for your children 
the Lord will help you and the Lord will help me so that in this church we'll keep the standard of the teaching and the people that see us and the people that see our children and the people that attend our wedding and the people that uh, visit us in our houses they will understand our moderation will be known unto all men in verses be careful for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving let your request be made known unto god here the lord is telling us that we will not allow worry and anxiety in our lives he says we should make sure that we are careful for nothing you believe the lord you stand for the truth and you make sure that all that you are doing and all that may be happening to you you leave that in the hand of the lord you will not be anxious you will not be worried about anything because you know that the Lord is on the throne. Somebody put it this way, said, It is not wise to bring the sorrows of tomorrow to disturb the joy and the duty of today. Leave tomorrow where it is. When you get there, you'll think about it. When you get there, you will do what you need to do. It is not wise to bring the sorrows of tomorrow to disturb the joy and the duty of today live a day at a time all anxiety of every kind is forbidden for the christian by the lord himself and if we're going to obey the lord he has told us not to worry and we will not worry because he is in control he is in charge of everything in matthew chapter 6 matthew chapter 6 reading from verse 25 therefore i say unto you take no thought for your life what ye shall eat or what ye shall drink nor yet for your body what ye shall put on is not the life more than the meat and the body more than raiment behold the fowls of the air they sow not neither do they reap nor gather into bands yet your heavenly father feedeth them are ye not much better than they which of you by taking thought getting worried getting anxious can add one cubit unto a stature and why take ye thought for image consider the lilies of the field how they grow they toil not neither do they spin yet i say unto you that even solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these wherefore if god so clothes the grass of the field which today is and tomorrow is cast into the oven shall he not much more clothe you shall he not much more clothe you yes he will O ye of little faith therefore take no thought saying what shall we eat or what shall we drink or wherewith shall we be clothed for after all these things do the gentiles seek for your heavenly father knoweth that ye have need of all these things but seek ye first the kingdom of god and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you therefore take therefore no thought for the morrow for the morrow shall take thought for the sin of itself sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof live a day at a time and leave tomorrow the future in the hands of the lord that's a path of obedience that's a path of submission unto god and you'll be blessed if you do that in jesus name in philippians chapter 4 verse 7 and the peace of god which passeth all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through christ i want you to know that that word and at the beginning of verse 7 is connecting you to verse 6 it's saying if you are not anxious if you are not worried if you cast all your cares upon the lord because he cares for you then the peace of god that passes all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through jesus christ now he tells us what we're going to think about he tells us how to think because our thought life is very important in fact this is the very secret of a happy victorious life our life is made up of our actions and our reactions and these actions and reactions are the product of our thoughts our thoughts therefore determine the quality of our lives 
to live a life of inner purity and holiness, our thoughts then must be controlled and centered on the things that were told of in verse 8. Look at verse 8. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. Here he tells us eight things on which we should be thinking. Center our thoughts. Number one, he says, we should center our thoughts on things that are true. Many times you disturb yourself because there are people that carry stories about. And these stories have no foundation. And these stories have not been verified. And the story is spreading. And the story is already disturbing your mind and disturbing your peace because you are thinking about it. You have not even investigated. You have not verified whether it is true or not. And yet the thing is disturbing you. Or somebody has done something and there is a thought that that thing must have been done deliberately against you. You have not found out. You have not investigated. You disturb your life. But whatsoever things are true, not things that are false, not things you have not verified, not things that are not, that are not have any foundation, having any base, not things that are doubtful. Those are the things we should think about. Then number two now, whatsoever things are honest, honest, the things that are worthy of Christ's name, the things that are worthy of Christ's honor. Not dubious things, fraudulent things, dishonest things in any way. You'll not think about all that. You'll not waste your time centering your thoughts on things that are not honest, whatsoever things are honest. Number three, whatsoever things are just. The things that are right and righteous. The things that are right in the light of Scripture. Before you waste your time, you should think about the thing. Is this right in the light of Scripture? Is it just in the light of scripture? A thought comes to your mind and then there's somebody wants you to think about it and you want to think about it too and you go through a night and you cannot sleep and the reason you are not sleeping is that you are thinking about something and you didn't even verify is that thing true? Is it honest? Is it just? Should this thing take my time? Should I even think about it at all? And if the thing is not just, just remove it from your mind. Number four, whatsoever things are pure. Think on something, many thoughts will just flash into your mind. It was Martin Luther that said that you cannot prevent a bird from flying over your head, but you can prevent it from building a nest over your head, on your head. And uh, sometimes a thought will flash into your mind. And the thought may not be something that is very pure, but uh, you didn't attract it, you didn't invite it, it just flew over you. But you do not have to allow it to remain there. You will ask yourself, is this thing pure? Is it proper? Is it chaste? Does it have anything to do with simple desires of the flesh in any way? If it has anything to do with that, just dismiss it. It cannot be for you because you are a child of God. Number five, whatsoever things are lovely lovely pleasing agreeable worthy of being loved by everyone who has the mind of christ before i can think about this thing is it a lovely thing if other people hear about this will they love it before you can think about it number six whatsoever things of good report if these things eventually comes into the open this thing you want to think about or this thing you are talking thinking about if it comes into the ears of your pastor of your wife, of your husband, if this thing that is brewing in your mind, in your heart, that you are concentrating upon, that you can't even think about any other thing now, if this thing will come out and your wife will see very clearly that this is what you are thinking about, will it make your wife happy? Or if you are a woman, will it make your husband happy? That thought in your mind. We're not even thinking about the action now. We're thinking about the thought itself. Whatsoever things of good report. Things that your converts will hear. 
and they'll be happy that oh we know our pastor we know our coordinator we know our overseer we know he's always like that he's a good man we love him because the report of what they are hearing about you is good report there are things that will be well spoken of by believers even unbelievers when they hear it it will be good report in their ears it will be good news in their ears and then number seven now it says if there be any virtue those are the things to think about virtuous things and then it says things that are related to moral excellence those, those are virtuous things number eight if there be any praise that is things that are praiseworthy in the sight of the lord it says those are the things we're to think about now when something occurs to you in the church it may be that it occurs to you about your fellow brother it occurs to you about your fellow sister and then you want to ask yourself should i think about it should i even consider it at all should i spend my time and allow it to rest in my mind there are eight gates that thing must pass through before it eventually gets settled down if it passes through only one gate and it doesn't pass through all the other seven gates you cannot allow that thing to take root in your heart what are the gates the, ga the gate of truth number one whatsoever things are true that's the first gate that thing that's occurring to you now before you think about it and before you allow it to settle down it's true but then that's just one gate it will also pass through the second gate whatsoever things are honest there are some things that are true but they may not be honest if for example they say that uh, somebody working in the bank has defrauded the bank it may be a fact it might have happened now you cannot be thinking about that that man is rich now and that man is enjoying life now because he defrauded the bank although that is a fact that he did that but it still will pass through other gates is that thing honest is that an honest way of being rich of having money no it is not although it gets through the first gate it doesn't get through the second gate you are not going to allow that thing it says whatsoever things are true gate two whatsoever things are honest gate three whatsoever things are just gate four whatsoever things are pure gate five whatsoever things are lovely Get six, whatsoever things of good report. Seven now, is the same virtuous. If there be any virtue, and get eight, if there be any praise, this is a praiseworthy, praiseworthy on earth, praiseworthy eternally. Now you are free to think about them. You see, if we apply that in our lives, it will strengthen your Christian character. There are things you'll never, never think about. You'll just say, well, that's none of my business. I can't think about that. Other people are carrying some stories about, and that thing will disturb your prayer life. It will disturb your consecration. Ah, if so-and-so can do that, why am I consecrated? I hear that so-and-so is doing this and that, and uh, they are just pretending that they are Christians. My friend, have you found out? Have you verified that thing? Have you investigated? Are you sure it is true? And what you are thinking about, is it honest? And is it just? Is it pure? Is it lovely? Is it of good report? Is there virtue in it? And is there praise in it? Before you can think about it, don't disturb your Christian life unnecessarily. And now he goes on to verse 9. It says, those things which ye have both learned and received and heard and seen in me do and the God of peace shall be with you. He was uh, calling upon these Christians. He said, I will have lived the life before you. Holily and justly and unblameably. And there's only one thing I can tell you now. Whenever there is any confusion in your mind. Should I do this? Shouldn't I do this? Just think about four things. Number one, what you have learned when I taught you. Number two, what you have received of what I taught you. Number three, what you have heard when we are teaching you. Number four, what you have seen as we demonstrated the perfect and the good example before you. As you consider those things, you have seen those things in us, you have heard it from us, you have learned it from us, and you have observed it as we have behaved before you, Lily, and justly and unblameably. That is what you are to do. And on the basis of that, the God of peace shall be with you. 
That's a conditional promise, and it is based on obedience to the preceding uh, word which we have read. When you hear, when you learn, when you receive, when you see, and then you do that, the God of peace shall be with you. Now we go to point number three, which is the source of consecration and contentment. The source of consecration and contentment. Here we find the Apostle Paul now, and he's going to give us uh, something of his own life. The Philippians had sent some gifts to him, and he was going to show appreciation. It starts in verse 10, it says, But I received, but I rejoice in the Lord greatly, that now at the last your care of me has flourished again, wherein ye were also careful, but she lacked opportunity. You know, Paul the Apostle, he always had a way of putting the best construction on it, on whatever anybody does. And that's what we should have, put the best construction on what people do. You know, he was languishing in the prison, and the Philippians did not come in time to minister to him, to give something to him. They didn't even visit him. And he had labored on that church at Philippi. And he didn't see them. They delayed. Eventually they came. And when they came, he didn't say, take your gift back. I don't need it again. I can live without it. Christ is with me. And the Lord is here. You think I'm depending upon your gift? Take it away from me. I don't want it again. You know, there are some people who say they are believers. And maybe they need something. And you are late in coming to them. And eventually you bring that in. You say, oh my brother, I'm very sorry. I'm just coming. He says, do I need it again? You think I cannot feed if I didn't see you? You think I will not uh, live a fulfilled life if I take, you, take your gift away? I don't need it again. Don't do that. Appreciate it. And then it says, Paul the Apostle said, I rejoice in the Lord greatly that now, at the last, your care of me has flourished again, wherein ye were also careful, but ye lacked opportunity. He was thankful. You know, the, a contented life. Very, very thankful. You know, some people, they say they are Christians, and maybe they are Christians, but they need to change. If you bring, if you give them something, and the thing is inside an envelope and it is money. Oh, you say, my sister, uh, you can have this one. They won't say thank you for us. They will take the envelope. They want to count because they want to know whether the amount is up to the amount I should say thank you or not. And so after counting and they see that uh, the thing is uh, just uh, 500 naira, they look at you like this. They say, this is all. No other thing. They say, all right. And then they turn. They don't return it to you, but they won't say thank you because they think it's not enough. But if they count and they see that there's 10,000 there, after counting, then they can smile. And then they'll say, thank you very much. But you know, Paul the Apostle was not like that. You do a little thing for him, and before counting the thing, and before he knows the value of what you have done, he will just say thank you. Let's learn that habit that when somebody does something to you, no matter how small, you will say, I rejoice in the Lord greatly. He had not come out of all the problems. He was still in the prison. And even though what they provided had not totally solved all his problems, he still was very grateful. And in verse 11, not that I speak in respect of want. It's not that I'm telling you to bring all your property and come and give me. For I have learned in whatsoever state I am, therewith to be content. That's the Christian life, the real Christian life in whatever condition state you may be, to be content in 1 Timothy chapter 6. 1 Timothy chapter 6. And from verse 6, but godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. And having food and raiment, let us be there with content. But they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare, and into many foolish and hurtful laws which drown men in destruction and perdition for the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. In Philippians, now in chapter 4, 
Philippians chapter 4, reading from verse 12. I know both how to be abased and how to abound. Everywhere and in all things, I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. You see, the context of the verse is saying, whether it's in the prison or in prosperity, whether it's in a popularity or it is abandonment, whatever condition I find myself, whatever God has ordained for me to do, I can do. And the condition does not matter. I live independent of my physical condition. I live independent of my physical environment. Whatever the environment may be, and whatever troubles there may be, I may be in, I still can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. That means some favorable condition will not hinder me. Inconvenient conditions will not hinder me. And I can still do everything that needs to be done by the grace of the Lord in the power of the Lord. That's the same attitude we should have and the same faith we should have that under any condition and in all circumstances, we still can do everything that, that God appoints for us to do. You ought to understand that there are things that God has appointed for you to do. The things God has not appointed for you to do is useless doing them. When you say, I can do all things, you must understand there are things appointed by God for you to do. They may be difficult. It may appear there are not enough resources to do them, yet you can do them because God has appointed for you to do them. It says now in verse 14, notwithstanding, ye have well done that ye did communicate with my affliction. He said, I wouldn't have suffered anything if you didn't give me. I wouldn't have felt uh, any pain if you didn't give me. If that thing was absent and your gifts were not there, I wouldn't have felt it at all because I've learned how to be abased and how to abound. And yet I must say thank you. Although I could do without it, but now that you have sent it, I must tell you that you have done well, that you did communicate with my affliction. Now, ye Philippians know in verse 15 also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church communicated with me as concerning giving and receiving, but you only. For even in Thessalonica, ye sent once and again unto my necessity, not because I desire gifts, no, but I desire fruit that may abound to your account. But I have all now, and abound. I am full. Think about it. He was in the prison. It's not that they all emptied their accounts. What did they come to give him there? The conditions in the prisons were still there. And the little he had, he didn't say, look at my condition here. It's a dungeon. The place is smelling. There is no light here. In fact, I can hardly write this epistle now. And if there is any grammatical mistake, uh, error in writing, understand it's because the light here is not very bright. In fact, I'm suffering here. No, he was in the prison and he said, I have all, all that I need, at least for my soul, for my spirit. And I'm happy here. In fact, I abound. I am full. Having received of Epaphroditus the things which were sent from you, an odor of a sweet smell, a sacrifice acceptable, well pleasing to God. Now he must pray for them because you see, they had given. He wanted them now to receive. He said, But my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Can the Lord do that? But you know the people that uh, Paul the Apostle wrote this to, they were people that were given. They were not stingy people. They gave. As a result of the giving, he was now telling them, you will reap a hundredfold of what you are sowing. And what you are going to reap is this, because you have supplied my need in this dungeon here, my God also will supply your need. Now that tells you something. He was telling them, I cannot repay you. I'm just an apostle. All I have, I have the message. I have the unction. I have the authority. I have the power. When it comes to material things that I don't have, therefore I cannot repay you. But I have a God that has in abundance. And my God, 
because you have taken care of his servant, my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. And that's the attitude that we ourselves, we need to have. Whenever other people have done something for us, then we should be grateful for what they have done. Now he's going to close the epistle. And then he closes the epistle. There are three words I want to bring to you as we close the epistle. The first one is the glory. And the second one is the greetings. And the third one is the grace. Here in verse 20 now, unto God our Father be glory forever and ever Amen. Salute every saint in Christ Jesus. The brethren which are with me greet you. And uh, all the saints salute you, chiefly they of Caesar's household. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Number one, the glory of God. And that is what he was living for. And he wanted them to know that from now on, just as it had been, unto God be the glory. He was reminding them that we as Christians, anything we do, it should be to the glory of God and the glory of God alone. In First, um, first Corinthians chapter 10, from verse 31, Whether therefore ye eat or drink, or whatsoever ye do, do all to the glory of God. Give none offense, neither to the Jews, nor to the Gentiles, nor to the church of God, even as I please all men in all things, not seeking my own profit, uh, but the profit of many, that they may be saved. Let that glory of God be the check, be the restraint for everything that you do. Is this going to glorify God? Is this action going to glorify God? Is this program going to glorify God? Uh, is this thought I even have in my heart? Is he going to glorify God? Meditating on such things like that. Let glory be given to the Lord. But now, on the social, on the social side, he brought greetings. You should be able to greet your converts. You should be able to maintain a kind of fellowship relationship with the people who are around you. And so he gave them greetings, and he even brought greetings from other people. And then he had started with grace. He had told them that the grace and the peace of the Lord, uh, coming from God through Jesus Christ, will be with them. He started with grace, and now he ended with grace. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Isn't that uh, how it is, the picture of our Christian lives? You start the Christian life with the grace of God. And at the time of temptation and trial, you need the grace of God. At the time of infirmity and weakness, you need the grace of God. And the Lord says, my grace is sufficient for you. And while you are closing your eyes, so you are about to go up in the rapture, you still find it is all by grace. From beginning to the middle to the end, we need the grace of God. And while we are enjoying that grace of God, we are living to the glory of God. God, and we find time to greet our fellow brothers and sisters. Let's rise up and talk to the Lord in prayer. Are you rejoicing always? Rejoice always in the Lord. Again, I say unto you, rejoice. Not walk by sight. Don't look at your circumstances. Don't grumble, don't complain, rejoice, rejoice in the Lord. Let there be unity. Don't contribute to discord or division. Don't contribute to quarreling, fighting, conflict in the church. If there is conflict anywhere, be a peacemaker. Don't put fire, the fire of division and destruction, in the fellowship of the brethren. Let there be unity. Let's be of one mind, of one heart, one judgment, one decision. Help one another. Don't bring those women down. Help them. Don't hinder them. Those young people. Don't hinder the ministry of the youth. The ministry of the students. Help them. Don't hinder them. 
and let your moderation be known unto all men. Even if God provides much money for you, still let your moderation be known to all men. A lot of good, good things you can do with the money. Don't be extravagant. And don't get into extremes in your lifestyle. There should be no pride, nothing to show off. Be careful for nothing. No worry, no anxiety. Don't destroy your life with worry and anxiety. Lean upon the Lord. Leave tomorrow in God's hand. You take some wrong steps if you think too much about tomorrow. You'll get into the flesh if you think too much about tomorrow. Live a day at a time. And let the peace of God sustain your heart. Your thought life, what are you thinking about? Whatsoever things are true. Is it true? Whatsoever things are honest. Whatsoever things are just. Whatsoever things are pure, is it pure? Whatsoever things are lovely, don't think about those ugly, ugly things that others will hear and say, What? How can sister think about that? How can pastor think about that? How can our father think about that? Whatsoever things of good report. There be any virtue, there be any praise. Think on these things. And follow the example that you have seen here. What you have learned. What you have heard. What you have received. What you have seen, do it. And be contented. Don't be covetous. Be contented with what you have. Learn to say thank you to your leaders, to your overseers, to your pastors, to your husband, and to your wife, to those who help you. No matter how small the help might be, learn to say thank you. And live in the confidence that you can do all things. All things that God appoints for you to do. Through Christ who strengthens you. Let the glory of God be your aim and your purpose in everything you do. Let the grace of God sustain and support you in all things. And don't forget, greet one another in fellowship and love.